everybody. Um, oh, right. <laughs> Welcome everybody and the robot to exploring allyship through an institutional lens, questions, failures, and practices of unlearning. I'll give you an idea about what we're going to do and what our objectives are, but I wanted to start off by just mentioning to you how this came about, why we wanted to do this. Many of you may well have participated in the October webinar on decolonization and will be aware that a number of the contributors to that uh, webinar called for allyship. They said that that was the next step, that was what they needed from us now. And so what we wanted to do as the CEDA conference committee was we wanted to try and respond to that and have some kind of session on allyship. Now, I'm, I, I'm not an expert on allyship. Um, I'm right at the beginning of my journey. And uh, I, I know from discussions that I've had with other people that when we look at institutions uh, across Britain, we find that people are in different stages. Some people are more advanced than others. So we thought it might be quite useful to look at allyship through an institutional lens to try and provoke some sharing of ideas, some sharing of good practice, concerns, uh, and so on. So the idea is that our contributors today are just are really there to facilitate the discussion, uh, but they are absolutely fascinating. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have 10 minutes of presentation from them where they'll talk about their journeys and what they're doing. Um, then five minutes for questions. And then that should leave us with 15 minutes or thereabouts at the end so that we can have a, a discussion in the round. Hopefully then we can take ideas back to our institutions or take things on board ourselves. Um, now, the contributors that I've got, two of them were recommendations from a contributor at that uh, October webinar. So Professor Marilyn Holness made recommendations, but our first speaker has been described to me as the very embodiment of allyship. And that is Tamara Tomic Bayajic. So if I can hand over to Tamara. Um, thank you so much, Judith. That's a really big thing to live up to, I think. And, and also, you will. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for inviting me and thank you for everyone. Um, thank you to everyone for being here. And uh, I come from dance department or actually now we are a school of art. So uh, Judith and I working closely together in school of arts, but I'm um, teaching and researching in dance studies programs. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience and what we have learned through this journey of not really knowing and unlearning along the way. Um, I should just say that, just like Judith said, I would not consider myself as an ally uh, just because it's very difficult to kind of nominate yourself or like give yourself, you know, like who gets to have a badge of, you know, kind of ally. Like it's a continual practice, I think. And that's how I think about it. I think it's just a continual practice of trying not to assume and trying to listen better, um, trying to hear what the colleagues are saying. And I'm thinking specifically of my colleagues uh, from black and global majority um, who identify um, in that way. And also our students who are very diverse student body. So I don't know whether I can, I mean, this is more for me to keep me on track. I want it to be very informal, but I tend to go on. So I have a few slides that I could just share with you if that's possible. Um, so I'm going to try to do that in a minute, just bear with me. Um, so that way I can just show you a few things that um, maybe visuals also help. Um, there we go. Um, I wonder whether you can all see this. Yeah, that's um, great. So I just wanted to say, um, when I think of allyship, but not just me, but what I'm learning along the way, I think it's just this continual practice of listening and trying to hear better. Um, and yes, there are lots of failings along the way. So I just wanted to show you a few things and uh, personally uh, to reflect back on some moments in my own department. Um, the first uh, kind of 
true call um, that we as a body of uh, like researchers and teachers in dance department at Roehampton received was when we uh, revalidated our postgraduate suite of master's programs. We created, uh, we reformed our module, which was called research methods, as you have them in the postgraduate suite into a module uh, called ways of knowing. And we thought that it's a really nice way to open out the question of what are research methods in dance practices, but not just practices, also in um, different forms of research. And we have very varied research expertise from dance anthropology to dance and community and health. So um, this module was also then able to um, sort of work across our department and bring in lectures from different strands of dance studies to give um, sharing of their own work. And students were amazing in that first 2016-2017 um, cohort. Their project in the module, their final project was to create their own um, research question around the topic of what are the ways of knowing in dance or what are the ways of knowing about the world through dance which can be embodied it could be you know related to our bodily senses but it could be also something in terms of like observing the world and dances in their socio-cultural or socio-economic contexts and one of the projects that came back to us uh, was by a student, um, American student, um, and you see her project here described by herself. And she called it White Ways of Knowing. <laughs> and what it turned out to be, we as a team of like, you know, lecturers very kind of interested in this whole opening out of questions, turning away power to the students to kind of de-school kind of our classroom. The response that we received was we didn't even notice how white was our curriculum. Because I think part of that was very unintentional as these uh, huge marginalizations and omissions oftentimes happen by accident, by not noticing. And that's how white privilege, I guess, works. You're not noticing it. That each one of us contributing um, what was our kind of proud expertise and work, oftentimes we used white um, examples or white scholars that we referenced and um, yeah this student picked up on it and created her work in response so it was a first kind of wake-up call you know not that this was the only one but the big big way in which a student is leading us um, to observe what it is that we are actually doing so she titled her project wwok or white ways of knowing to kind of turn our attention to what it is that we are doing so we, um, I mean, it was a very, uh, by external examiners project that was really highly rated. It was very creative, but at the same time, very discursive. Um, and, and from there, we started to really be kind of much more trying to be more uh, invested in learning about what are we think that we are doing and actually trying to understand how come these kinds of situations happen, that students are noticing something and we are not. And that also means that uh, in addition um, to our students, we also had to kind of understand more about like the kinds of things that can happen in a module like ways of knowing. So what we did instead is um, um, our colleague, Dr. Cristina Rosa, who is a Brazilian scholar, um, and you can see her book um, cover on the left. She works with um, the notion of embodiment through dance movement as, a, as a markers of social and cultural identity and in the Brazilian context, and she's capoeira practitioner as well. She started to lead the module Ways of Knowing. Immediately, we saw, saw a lot of differences because, for example, just uh, the picture next to it was instead of having this balletic work as a case study where we kind of approach it from different knowledges in dance, like anthropology questions would be this, philosophical questions would be this. This time we changed it and started to look into the opening of the Olympics with Akram Khan's example, which brought immediately some questions of, you know, who is considered British, uh, who is considered the other. So the module started to open out. Um, and those of us who were white colleagues were then kind of thinking about the ways in which we might respond. 
and Christina very much pushed us toward kind of thinking about what does it mean to move beyond the matrix or like what does it mean to move against the grain in our own scholarship. Um, our other colleague Avanti Maduri, uh, who is a practitioner of Bharatanatyam, but also a scholar of dance history, uh, who writes about different histories um, of Indian dance was also a contributor. So we looked at epistemological approaches that immediately try to displace what we assume. Um, and that's a long process. This didn't happen along the way. A lot of times we heard Christina saying, you guys, you're still bringing too many Western centric um, and sort of, you know, um, readings that are canonical are still considered from one type of epistemology. So we included this uh, reading from um, Bo Boaventura de Souza Santos, The End of the Cognitive Empire, alongside, um, you know, other readings that we had the score for the module. So that became kind of like a way of sort of call to action and response, but that's not smooth. That's always kind of like you always as a, I don't know, at least in my experience as a, as a white scholar, you always tend to go to what you are comfortable with and what you know. And oftentimes you think you're doing enough. And then um, when I talk to my, my colleague like Christina or Avanti, they're not noticing that I'm doing something different when I'm thinking that I am. Thank you, Judith. So just to move on and to tell you like there are these kind of continual situations where you're listening, you're thinking, you're responding, you're failing to be um, noticed in that response, and then you repeat, you know, so it's a really continual question of like just being in tune with what you're doing. And that also brings us just to share with you how this continues, you know, so even though you're thinking you're really moving in the right direction, there is this uh, moment uh, in June where our postgraduate students, due to the events in the US, because our student body is very um, uh, socially engaged and uh, lots of diverse practitioners from the US, um, they um, wanted us to respond. And it took us a while to create a collective letter in response, a statement of solidarity, all of us contributed and are, you know, um, from different perspectives to write this statement. And then our amazing students on the right, um, you will see that they actually wrote us back after this and we held a town hall meeting, but they wanted more. That wasn't really enough. Like the statement like that, they said, okay, that sounds great. That's fantastic. We're so excited, but actually how are you going to do it? We demand accountability, as you can see here, they taxatively wrote down what they expect from us, they wanted answerability, so they pushed us much, much further than we were, you know, when you're busy and you're overworked and you have to, you know, make sure that you respond to everyone's email and you see your students for tutorials and you do your lectures and you do your PhD supervisions and your own research for the REF in the UK. Um, then you're thinking you're doing quite enough and then the students tell you I'm sorry it's not enough and so instead of that we actually committed to this um, much much uh, more explicit anti-racist action in response to the students letter and now we're working toward that so we are there somewhere you know trying to kind of figure out how to best serve our students and just wanted to um, say that this is broader than just our university because in our field um, of dance, theater and performance practice, there are other initiatives as well. So they also feed into um, our work. And just to draw your attention to these two links, one is the letter, open letter written by uh, black and global majority colleagues um, from our field to us as white colleagues. So it's called White Colleague Listen. And a group of um, uh, scholars created this other space for people who are interested in taking some anti-racist action to be involved. Um, and this is a, a way of kind of thinking through how much, much more forcefully we could push as white people or, you know, maybe more kind of privileged in certain ways in academia to actually uh, use our platform to shift that labor of anti-racism so that it's not always falling on the backs of our colleagues of color who are always having to explain and re-explain what needs to happen, but how can we listen and take action? 
So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you so much. For Lovely. This. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Yeah. So it's now over to participants for, um, or delegates rather, for five minutes of questions. Who would like to start? Sorry. As I was saying, there's a question in the chat box from Emma. Um, Emma, I don't know if you want to take the microphone or if you're happy for me to read it out. Either way, I, as I've got the microphone, Go for I'll, it. I'll just read it out. Thank you. Um, firstly, thank you so much, Tamara. That was incredibly exciting and interesting. And I really like that you acknowledge that kind of as, you know, as a fellow white person trying to be an ally that when we think we're kind of okay I'm doing okay, I'm doing some change actually we need to keep checking ourselves and keep checking those perceptions um I know that for a few departments that are trying to implement these changes you get sometimes division between staff and kind of yeah. some staff resistance I was wondering if you experienced any of that and if so how you dealt with it yeah, I think it's, um, and thank you so much, Emma. Yes, to totally, I, I do recognize that. And uh, as I said, it's a, it's a kind of like a journey, you know, for the whole collective um, or for the whole team of people. And we are still, even though we have very diverse student body, I think a lot of people know this. We, I mean, a lot of our departments are still very, very white. And our department is, you know, we have a handful of colleagues who identify as black black or global majority colleagues but we have many more of us who are you know identifying or you know we're white white passing and and for us all to have these conversations sometimes they're brought up by the pain of our colleagues who are actually having to reiterate over and again and you still have these conversations where somebody would say something like Oh yes, but also you know Irish white community doesn't have so you will immediately get a different um, sort of almost like a little bit of um, a, not a pushback but qualification and we all actually have this notion of well what I know from my experience is not privilege right I come from a country that was in the Balkans fighting to get in recognized as European and I you know when I talked to that student in 2017 felt my own white fragility you know it's like oh yes but I'm not that um, same person you cannot put me together I was not in colonizing country but actually you have to I mean I think it's all of this work that we all have to do individually ourselves and sometimes these conversations where we have these frictions in the room and people saying these kinds of things I think those of us who are maybe more confident to say yes but maybe now it's not the topic you know maybe yes of course there are different kinds of injustices in the world different kinds of unprivileged positions that can be interrogated but let's focus on this moment we're talking about anti-blackness you know and so let's not talk about that experience let's so it's it's some of us who are more ready in the room who need to stand up and say these things I think that's the only way but in the meantime it's a it's a lot of work that we are all doing I'm sure in our own ways to kind of check in with what does this mean for me you know, it wasn't until I read the book that I found the book about race in Yugoslavian region, you know, that I could actually comprehend how much I don't know, you know, so it's kind of like there is that kind of work and there is this other work where you're really listening to your colleagues and trying to push that work away from them, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks Emma for your question and thank you Tamara for that response. I think Catriona, if we have others, we will have to leave them for now. We will have an opportunity yes. to return to this. And thank you. Thank all. you. Thank you, Tamara. And if I can now hand over to our second contributor, Alison Carlyle. Hi, thank you, Judith. Um, mine's, my presentation's um, very different. It's more about a personal journey, uh, which, has, uh, uh, which I've been on th looking at anti-racism. So I've done some slides, uh, so I'm gonna share them. So I call it BAME allyship, but as I was writing this presentation, I decided that anti-racist allyship is a better term. I don't actually like 
B-A-M-E, and I know that, uh, that I'm not on my own there. So I'm actually not gonna use that acronym. I'm gonna use the term ethnic people when I'm giving my talk today. So um, I've uh, worked in higher education for 30 years. Um, I've been a trade union rep for about 15 years. Um, I'm not a professional, as I've already said, allyship is a journey because I care and I've, and I've long fought against uh, harassment, any sort of harassment or bullying. Um, I've got a diverse group family and group of friends and from a young age, I can consider myself anti-racist. Um, however, I know I realise that there's a lot of work to be done and I'll sort of guide you through my story. But I was uh, born in southwest London in the 1960s in, um, in a very privileged area. So, and my mother was a RE and English teacher and my father a research scientist. And they were both very highly educated and establishment. Um, there were pretty much, it was pretty much 100% white in the area I was living in. Um, I know it was different in other parts of the country and other parts of London. Um, and if, for people who are younger, um, there's a current series of small acts films on the BBC, um, which uh, depict life in uh, London of the sort of 60s and 70s. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I've, I've been volunteering as a union rep. And as that work, I witnessed the effects of racism in higher education. Um, I had staff coming to me who had experienced um, overt racism and they came to me for help. Um, I also noticed the vertical segregation of the workforce and the race payback gap. Um, I worked alongside a black female union officer on a national level negotiating panel on the gender pay gap and we started to campaign to take the work further to include race and ethnicity and also the other um, protected characteristics that have come out of the 2010 Equality Act. Um, I also worked alongside the Director of Human Resources. She used to, um, when she was, she's left unfortunately, but she used to um, scheduling informal meetings and we put together the equality objectives of the university. Um, so the top one is to improve the recruitment and retention of black, Asian and minority ethnic BAME staff. And then also um, the student body at Roehampton University is majority ethnic and they have been campaigning for decolonization of the curriculum and more representative tutors. We've still got a long way to go. Um, and I started reading, for example, there's a, a, a place called the Runnymede a Place, an organization called the Runnymede Trust, and they produced um, an, a, 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 some research called Aiming Higher Race Inequalities and Diversity in the Academy. And then there's some other resources on that slide. So I just wanted to talk about the Rapper 2 project because this has come out of um, Roehampton alongside uh, Queen Mary's University and Carshalton College. Um, and it's really about the uh, student attainment gap. When I heard about this, which was a number of years ago, I actually cried. I was so upset by it. It was a bit embarrassing because I was in a, in a, in a, in a quite high level equality committee. And um, anyway, I, I decided I was gonna up my game and I, did any training I could. So I'm fortunate to work with an amazing woman, um, a professor who's been awarded with an MBE and she led this project, Rafa2. So this is a website you can go and it's full of resources. Um, I'd recommend exploring it. Um, so uh, the project combines student voice and lived experience from these three very different higher education institutions that I've already mentioned. Um, so it was set up to close, to address and close the student again, attainment gap. And um, so the lead academic, I'll mention her by name, is Professor Marilyn Holness. Um, and I went to every single training session that I could that she put on, um, I, and I learned a lot from her training. And there was always an emphasis on listening to the lived experience of students and of um, other ethnic um, people. Um, for, one of, for me, one of the most standout recommendations was to make friends with ethnic people. And although this is something I've always done, um, 
I needed to do it more and I wanted to examine just how many, how many, you know, how many real friends did I have who come from different ethnicities and weren't white. Um, and then to talk about them, about their experience of racism, if they're prepared to talk. There'd also be books always displayed at, at these training sessions and I started to read them. Um, so another um, resource I found is this, it's the Green Living Room. And it talks of that, as Tamara had talked, talked about, talks about lifelong unlearning. Um, so the Green Living Room has a section, it's from the Green Party, and it has a section on anti-racism allyship. Um, so they have a powerful message about lifelong unlearning, which I'm going to read to you. Social and environmental justice are indivisible, but this is not a message that fits into a sound bite. To truly create change, we must engage people in conversations which reveal the truth about how the solutions to the crises we face are interdependent. They say that there is a very real need for folks to unlearn the systemic and violent racism of our white-centered society. So, and this web page is meant to encourage each one of us to commit to the everyday practice of identifying, challenging, and changing the values, structures, and behaviors which perpetrate, perpetrate racism in our society. So this leads me nicely on to my next slide, which is about this book. This is a workbook, um, Me and White Supremacy. And it was, uh, I, I, I uh, decided this year to work through it um, as a direct consequence of the George Floyd, George Floyd murder in May. My niece, who's a history teacher, and she taught at a school where there was 100% non-white students in East London. Um, she, she was so upset by the murder that she decided to run for her family and friends um, an educational workshop, um, looking at history from the colonized perspective rather than the colonizer perspective. And so I invited some of my friends and later in conversation, we decided that we would, we would do this book. Um, so you can get it for free, but I bought it. It's on my Kindle. And she says, all you need to do the work is your truth, your love and your commitment. And she says, it's, it's hard, it's difficult work to do. And um, here are some of the topics that are included in the book. And it is indeed, it's very challenging and it's difficult. It frequently makes me really angry. Um, I started with a group of six people and there's only two of us left. Um, and we meet regularly on Zoom and share our journaling. You can do it on your own. You don't have to do it in a group. Um, the, the book is designed for 28 days of journaling, but we're doing it much more slowly. And each topic, uh, I, I quite often go and learn more about it. I start looking at the internet, looking up papers and things because it's just so big. And some of the things I haven't even really heard about before, um, I didn't know about tone policing. Um, oh, there's lots of things I didn't know about and I'm, and I'm learning. How long left? Two Just minutes? a minute. A minute. Okay, so let me quickly end on this, which is a really lovely TED talk by Chimamanda Adichie. So she talks about the danger of the single story, which is about um, stereotyping. Um, and um, she says, show people as one thing, as only one thing over and over again. And that is what they become. The, she says that the single story creates stereoty stereotypes and it robs people of dignity, dignity um, and that these stories can break the dignity of the people. But stories, she says, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And she finishes with this thought that when we reject the single story, when we realize there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. And then my very last thought will be from another talk of hers. She did a, did a TED talk in 2013, We Should All Be Feminists. She's a Nigerian author and she wrote um, Half of a Yellow Sun. Um, so my final thought is that culture, her thought, which I'm quoting, is that culture does not make people, people make culture. So if it is in fact true that the full humanity of women is not our culture, then we must make it our culture. And she's talking about Nigerian culture. But I, what this quote says to me is that it is everybody's responsibility to make our university cultures inclusive. 
and, what, and white people are crucial in the process and can help achieve this by consciously allying with our ethnic colleagues, students and friends. That brings me to a close. Lovely, Alison. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we again, we have five minutes for questions. can't see any questions coming up in the chat but I am I, I oh, sorry there is there's a chat from Eva there question not a chat so um I wanted to come in and, and link Tamara and Alison's talk about to along the lines of institutional uh the context for allyship if we could perhaps talk about what kind of context you're facing that might be supportive of the work you're doing Tamara and Alison um do you mean what exists in the institution more broadly? Yes, um, broadly. Yeah, so I think uh, what um, um, Alison was mentioning, we have a new kind of uh, office for student engagement, which works on one side on how to kind of close the attainment gap, for example, and maybe Alison, you can talk a little bit more about that here from your side. But let's say for our work that is being supported by these university structures, we're kind of trying to look now that, I mean, this year is really tricky for all the reasons, but also because in our university, our School of Arts is now being structured as a School of Arts from different departments. So that means that, for example, we had to find a way to um, think about the ways in which our um, commitment, anti-racist six-point commitment to our students, is not somehow sitting in one part of the School of Arts in dance programs, but rather how can it be you know, structurally now rethought to serve different communities across the School of Arts. So that's something that is already in the process. So I'm just thinking like how the broader structures in the university can support us. Sometimes it goes to supporting like a very particular student needs. So we go to this uh, sort of broader office for student engagement. And, you know, we have students who on those six points wanted some kind of closer work with uh, artists uh, outside of academia who have who share their experience maybe they work on similar topics or you know they are identifying as global majority and so they want to work with those artists rather than you know always having a um, tutor from our department so then we go to the office for student engagement and say are there funds that we can maybe facilitate this student's project the same goes for um, you know different structures that are now being put in place like uh, there is a new committee that is just being uh, I think Judith can talk about that a little bit more but there is a new committee for like looking at the curriculum more broadly and there is a, another committee at looking at staffing and practicing of kind of hiring whether VLs or like permanent staff so there are kinds of things that in dialogue with these smaller initiatives that we already have started then the university sometimes says okay we're recognizing this is need for broader than let's say dance um, and that's how it happens but sometimes we also go to these bigger structures that we have to see what kinds of resources they can have to implement on a smaller scale. I don't know, Eva, does that answer your question at all? Yeah, thank you. I just thought it might be interesting to connect what you and Tamara were saying really by engaging with the institutional context more broadly. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks. can I just say um, that uh, um, I'm, I've just um, at work have launched a women's meeting and in that we, uh, we were talking a lot about anti-racist allyship and one, but one of the things the aiming the running me trust aiming higher um, report says is that it's all very well having good policies, but you need the actual commitment, real commitment as well. And so uh, we're constantly people in the EDI committees are constantly challenging senior management to 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 actually put a proper commitment in place. And it's slow, but it's it's beginning to happen, I think. Okay, thank you, Eva, for that question. I, I think we need to move on now to our final contributor. Thank you, Alison. Um, so our final contributor is M. Cookson-Williams. Hello, thank you very much, um, Judith. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about allyship a little bit from a from a different perspective, really. So I'm considering... Um, uh, sorry, go with... The perils of Zoom. 
ap apologies for the background noise. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about allyship from a from a different perspective. So considering LGBTQ plus allyship and, and thinking about its integration um, in Roehampton. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm gay and I'm also non-binary. Um, so I'm very much part of, of the LGBT community. Um, so I myself wouldn't necessarily kind of uh, be an ally in, in that sense. Uh, but I'm kind of definitely welcoming of, of allyship and, and appreciative of, of allies. Um, and working with others to explore how allyship um, can work. So although there's certainly kind of many crossovers um, in, uh, in many aspects of a kind of general allyship, um, I think there's certainly something around LGBTQ plus allyship that, that needs to acknowledge the invisibility um, that can often enshroud the LGBT community. So, you know, you think about when you meet someone you don't always know what their sexuality is and it's certainly uh, you know not the type of thing that someone will kind of introduce themselves um, with kind of the first time that, that you meet them and and often it's it's the same with gender identity as well so you know can you know someone's gender identity just by looking at them or by speaking to them or even sending them an email um, and so i think really an important part of, of allyship in this sense is about being aware it's about being active and it's about being an ally even when we may not see those that we're an ally for around us it's about trying to start conversations about making the invisible visible um so just to, to give i guess a bit of context to it uh, in the last couple of years is that there's some reports that stonewall the lgbt <coughs> charity have have done uh, and, uh, and one of those reports found that 42% of LGBT students hid or disguised that they are LGBT at university in the last year because they were afraid of discrimination. And a report about around kind of workplaces found that a third of LGBT staff um, had also hidden or disguised that they're LGBT um, at work because they were afraid of, of discrimination. So there's definitely something around the environment um, that I guess kind of further creates that, that invisibility. I mean, that, that data itself, um, you know, shows that the LGBT community in certain circumstances feels safer being invisible. And I think that's where we really need um, allies to, to play a part. This is where kind of allyship is, is really crucial in saying, look, you, you are seen, you are heard, you are okay here, you, you are safe here. Um, so at, at Roehampton, I'm, a, I'm the co-lead for the staff LGBT network, um, and I'm also a student wellbeing officer, and, and I have quite a focus on supporting LGBTQ plus um, students. And this is something that, that certainly I've been trying to, to embed at, um, at the university. This is that idea of kind of working to explicitly be inclusive um, and to support and encourage explicit allyship rather than just kind of, you know, resting on our laurels and kind of saying, well, you know, we are an inclusive institution. We do welcome all, you know, we provide support to all. It's actually kind of thinking that next step further and, and actually how, how do we do that in a very explicit way? Um, so one initiative that, uh, that we've developed uh, to, to try and kind of help support visibility and certainly really try and, and encourage allyship um, is uh, Rainbow Lanyards. You can see I'm, I'm sporting one and I see that Tamara is also supporting uh, a lovely Rainbow Lanyard. Um, so this was a, an initiative that was developed by the, the Staff LGBT Network. I think it kind of launched maybe about 18 months ago. Um, and the idea was that, that those who were part of the network um, could then have a, a Roehampton branded rainbow lanyard. They could either then kind of be visible as a, as a member of the LGBT um, Q plus community um, or be visible as, as an ally. Um, and it's Liga, Alison's putting hers on as well. Um, so it's definitely definitely been a hugely successful initiative, um, but I think the, the most crucial part of it has been how it's developed the conversation around LGBTQ plus allyship. So things around what it means to be an ally, why might it be important to wear a rainbow lanyard? How does wearing a rainbow lanyard show that you're an ally? And even thoughts around well, is wearing a lanyard enough 
to call yourself an ally? And I think that that's certainly a difficult question to, to answer. Um, you know, is, is it enough? Perhaps not quite, but it's certainly um, a really important step forward. Um, I think having staff members who are saying, yes, I want to wear a robo lanyard. I want to show that I acknowledge the LGBTQ plus community. I'm supportive and I'm, I'm inclusive of that community um, is, a, is a real active step towards, I guess, effectively kind of institutional allyship with the LGBT community. But I think the point definitely is that it's that it's a first step and a first step in, in perhaps kind of many steps towards allyship in this sense. So I also just wanted to, to touch on kind of thinking about, um, you know, those, those next steps, thinking about moving forward towards institutional allyship and um, some other initiatives that, that, we're, that we're working on. And one of them um, is queering the curriculum. So we've already had a uh, kind of reference with Tamara and, and Alison um, around kind of this term of, of decolonizing the, the curriculum. And that's definitely one that's become kind of commonplace um, in educational institutions over uh, the last couple of years and, and certainly quite quite rightly so it's a it's a really important movement um, and i guess kind of queering the curriculum is a is a different spin on that type of of movement so really it's it's about exploring how are we framing our curriculum the content of, of the learning that we're providing and really trying to examine its foundations um, with the aim of, of trying to really break away from, from that heteronormative and, and cisgendered uh, societal default that, that we have and definitely trying to kind of move towards a more inclusive uh, kind of curriculum, more, more inclusive content that has quite explicit recognition and acknowledgement and, and engagement with queer LGBTQ plus people, lives um, and, and experiences and, and stories. I mean, you know, we all know um, that not every scientist was um, a straight man. Um, not every writer was cisgender. And, and we certainly know there, there are definitely many figures in history that, that were queer. So it's certainly time that, that our curriculum reflected this and, and actually acknowledged these invisible identities. So this is something that we're, that we're now trying to take on at Roehampton. So we're trialing, um, uh, queering the curriculum uh, and trying to launch that in our School of Arts, uh, supported by our Inclusive Practice Working Group, which is headed up by the wonderful Judith. Uh, and the aim of this is, is to try and get students involved, just as, as we did with our decolonizing the curriculum project that was running our social sciences department um, a couple of years ago. And the hope is definitely that we can really try and open up what our curriculum looks like in, in different subject areas, give it a new framing and really try and explore queer content in a way that hopefully adds value to, to what it is that students are studying and, and provides a platform for those, those queer identities. I mean, as I've mentioned, it's, it's about trying to make the invisible visible. Um, so really, that's that's kind of what I wanted to, to share with you today. There are, there are lots of ways in which we can think about allyship and, the, and there are lots of minority groups that allyship is, is very important for. And this really is just just some of the journey that Roehampton is, is taking in, re, in regards to LGBTQ plus allyship. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so we have now a, a few minutes for questions specifically to Em and then we'll open up generally. Does anybody have any questions? Well, just maybe to even try and trigger something, I must say I've, I'm, as I said, right at the start of my allyship exploration and I have uh, met with Alison um, and, and done an exercise uh, in the, the Layla side book and it does make you really interrogate all aspects of your practice. It makes it is deeply uncomfortable and it has really made me think about uh, not just decolonization, but queering the curriculum as well. Um, I, allyship is not easy and I'm right at the beginning and I'm already feeling scared, I must say. What about others? Well, if I can come in, um, I think 
picking up from what Amy was saying there, I think she raised a very interesting point about uh, the curriculum and rethinking the curriculum. And um, uh, yeah, I was uh, reflecting on that and I realized that yes, the the foundations of the curriculum they need to be shaken mm -hmm. we need to rethink those foundations of the curriculum so and it's a big challenge because when you think about the foundations of the curriculum we are looking at historical issues here that are deeply entrenched in this curricula mm -hmm. and we are looking at some philosophical epistemological underpinnings of that curriculum that needs to be challenged and to be changed so if we don't have that commitment you know it's very difficult someone talked about truth uh, love and commitment the challenge again is truth is quite a flexible you know concept whose truth and how do we determine that truth but yes i quite agree with all the presenters and the commitment they have demonstrated in what they are doing i think it's it's, it's just you know inspiring to have such people in our midst and i hope we can all be ignited and you know, see the need to work on these very important topics and see how we can bring about change because I think it's time for change. No one is born racist, it's through socialization. Um, culture, you know, people make the culture, culture doesn't make the people. I know how education was used, for example, in Africa to denigrate the local people's culture and extol one group's culture. So I still think through education, we can bring about changes to unlearn some of the practices that are deeply embedded in the existing curriculum today. That's all I wanted to say, but uh, really, appreciate you know the the, the 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 remarks made by colleagues who have been sharing today thank you and thank you because i think really in a way gladson what you, what your comment has done is it now opens the discussion to everybody else and i think this would allow us to think about what's happening in other institutions at the minute so would anybody like to take the floor and share with us what they're doing or their thoughts there was a couple of questions. Oh, that no, that's that's absolutely yeah. fine. That's fine. I think, Sorry. But I think tie in exactly to to what you're saying and um, one from David earlier around the question of the canon and then one from um, Rosalina around uh, I suppose language and maybe back to the idea of of unease. I don't know if either of you want to come on and and develop those questions. Don't be shy. No, no, I won't be shy. No, I knew you wouldn't. I'll break the habits of a lifetime and not. <laughs> oh, thank you, Judy. Um, I, I, there was an early comment about um, the canon, and I started to think, what is the canon? Um, and then I thought, do I automatically put something on the canon by putting it on the reading list? And then I thought, no, there's going to be something on the reading list. I mean, we'll. That's a separate conversation. Where does the reading list come from? But then I got to, it's not whether it's on the reading list or not, maybe it's the way we treat it. Maybe, I'm trying to find a, a noun. I'll start again. I don't think putting it on the canon, I don't think putting it on the reading list makes it part of the canon. I think the way we treat it is what makes it canonical. And I wonder about approaches to the literature, the established literature, the new literature. I wonder if people know things about how to approach texts which we offer to people, which uses them as prompts for conversation and thought, but doesn't give them this heroic canonical status. That's probably enough for me. 
I can thank you, David. I think I can just kind of, if that's okay, um, respond to that in just a couple of points. I think one of the good examples we all probably know is how SOAS, right? They, I don't know whether there is anyone from SOAS here, but how SOAS decided very purposefully, you know, to keep oriental in their name just so that they can continue to kind of work through that problem of you know orientalist view and how that was like the discipline you know for a while and and problematizing the very word in their own name of the institution is one way to kind of rub against that notion that David you're describing of like is it the the actual words or text that we use or how do we approach them and I think you know different people will maybe have different views on this and I know also you know lectures by Sarah Ahmed who says like the more times you cite someone you create almost like a uh, you know pathway which is brick lane you know where other people follow so that's why it's important to be mindful of who do we cite and how often because those become entrenched ways so can we create some new desire lines you know as uh, architects would say like you know when people walk through the grass in a different pathway than what is the actual established route maybe that's another way to think about that question about canon but I definitely think at least for us it worked in dance you know we work with ballet quite a lot and and there are these ballet authors from the 19th century that we now offer to the first year students, but we say, pay attention to the words, pay attention to how he describes this author who writes about classicism, who do they describe as, you know, people on a, um, who are more, you know, so they use word graceful for someone, but they use word primitive for someone, like, let's go into that text a little bit more deeply. So definitely it's not erasing certain, um, uh, things, but it's more like opening them out to be all equally questioned, but at the same time offering alternative texts as well. So I think that's... Don't, don't erase, do critique. Okay, right. Yeah, but at the same time understood. offer alternatives as well, yeah. so that those are not the only ones who stay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't, I don't think it's possible to get away from necessarily the canon, because there is a canon. You know, I think it's important to bring a critical you know, view the kind of through a critical lens and equip students with the skills to do that. And as you say, offer uh, readings uh, from, from the global south, offer a sort of a, a critical analysis of the, the terminology that's being used. If I may, in dance, certainly modern dance, there's a kind of essential enmeshment in and kind of cross-cultural world cultures, even though the way in which they draw on those cultures may be problematic. So Miss Cunningham, for example, etc. So there is so much scope in dance, I think, for, for yeah. to, to taking that broader view of culture and, and of identities, that sort of critical uh, sort of uh, view of identities is, yeah. to my mind, very much built into the, you know, the, the practice of dance. Yes, yeah. yeah, Eva, thank, thank you so much for saying very that. Very helpful, yeah. thank you. Um, May I just add one more thing? I had, I, I just wanted to draw the three um, panelists together around the question of uh, the, the way in which allyship might need to be reframed to take account of intersectional experiences and identities, because it's, it seems to me that you're speaking to that, that question in different ways. Yes, I think I just want to say this one more thing, which I was so struck by, like how beautifully M described what is importance of being also uh, someone who needs allies, but also at the same time being an ally in some other framework. So allyship is not one thing, but it's all these different um, practices where we might feel um, maybe, you know, um, I guess marginalized in one area, but less in another and more uh, possible to sh like, you know, promote somebody else's experience through our platform. So. I think, Eva, I'm with you in that intersectionality is like the right way to think. Mm. Can I just add to that as well, in that it's, that's when you start to get to, I guess, the real complexities of, um, I, I guess, ultimately of the, of the world we're in, but how important allyship is when you really start to, to think about intersectionality um, because of, of the way in which nobody is one singular identity um, and if you have even just one part of your identity that falls within a, a kind of a, a minority group then 
there's there's certainly things that you're going to experience on that level but there might be other parts of your identity where actually you have more privilege and i think there's certainly work to be done for individuals in acknowledging where you experience your privilege and therefore where your allyship may be best placed but also for for allies to to think about is my work just focusing in this one kind of area or actually are there ways in which my allyship spans a range of identities and therefore there's far more nuances in, in what I'm trying to support and, and the, you know, the activism that I'm trying to, to have. Okay, thank you, Catrion. I think, was there another question coming through? Yeah, there was a, a question that came through from Rosalina who'd asked me to read it out and I think we've sort of touched on it really but it ties into what Letizia was asking around the question of language and so Rosalina, how have you been able to navigate, engage and celebrate the vocabulary of diverse stories as part of allyship journey, which I think ties into what Letizia was asking around strategies that work well to navigate that kind of discomfort that can emerge? Big questions with three minutes to go. Mm, yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't actually sort of stand in front of a class and lecture, but I've just decided I'm just going to talk about things and uh, and just doing it, just do it, you know. Um, not going to be perfect and there's a lot to learn and um, people are uh, understanding and forgiving around that. Um, I, I, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, but some of the key messages just to pick up and as we move towards the close of this uh, session, um, I've picked up from our contributors listening. This keeps repeating itself, listen. Lifelong unlearning, which is where the pain comes in. We're not going, it's not a quick fix. Um, make the invisible visible, I think was a very strong statement that we got. And don't, erase, don't delete, critique. And then I just want to finish off with um, a quote from uh, the chat, I think it's possibly disappeared now, which was from Farouk who was disappearing and said, thank you for a very thought provoking session. And I think it certainly has been. And I think Cedar can maybe take this forward to another session or perhaps even a whole conference exploring some of the issues that have been raised in this in this period so thank you very much to everybody who's asked questions and to everybody to Tamara to M and to Alison thank you very much for your for sharing your journey with us thank you very much for having me oh thank pleasure. You, Judith. extremely welcome thank you for having me as well thank you for the conversation Thanks to all the delegates. I'm going to stop the recording now.